if you think about what's going on, you see maybe not the millennials, but at least generation C or seven, like we say here in Canada, they're not using Google to search for stuff. They're using TikTok. They're using YouTube. They're using voice search. They're asking their friends. So content has to change for the new generation. So we cannot keep doing the same things. What does it really mean to be a thought leader in B2B? That's what we're here to find out. This is The Notorious Thought Leader, a podcast for B2B marketers who want to generate demand by creating content that builds credibility and thought leadership. In each episode, Aaron Balsa helps demystify thought leadership and uncovers how companies are using thought leadership to generate demand. Let's get started. My guest today is Diego Pineda, Content Marketing Manager at Dooley and founder at Thought Leadership Marketing. Thanks for being here, Diego. It's a pleasure, Erin. Thanks for inviting me. Of course, I'm so happy to have you on and chat with you. You know, the reason I really wanted to chat with you specifically is because you are passionate about the new school of content marketing and writing disruptive thought leadership. And I am too. And I love to talk about that and really dig into old school versus new school. But before we do, I want to start the show like I start it with every guest by asking you the question, what the fuck is thought leadership? Right. So I say that thought leadership is the intersection between three things. So it's expertise, innovation, and education. So it all starts with a subject matter expert who develops a new way to solve a problem and then educates others about that problem and the new solution. And let me give you an example. You know Seth Godin, right? Of course. And, and Seth, in the 1980s, uh, Seth Godin was full on on the advertising industry. And he was just witnessing how companies were spending lots of money on TV ads, on print ads, without knowing the ROI of their investment. They had no idea if their messages were resonating with people. So he said, this has to change. So he studied how advertising was done. He invented a new marketing category, which is permission marketing, which is like one of the pioneers before inbound marketing and what we do today. But he was one of the first. And so he was an expert in the industry. He innovated, he created a new category, and then he began educating others through his books. He wrote a book of permission marketing, and then he wrote blogs. At one time, his blog was the most popular blog in the world. So videos, online courses, talks. So he had those three things, expertise, innovation, and education. And I think most B2B companies don't do thought leadership today because they're missing one of those three elements. Mm, that's so interesting. I love like hearing how different people define it, right? And I've gotten some really interesting definitions. We've had Tara Robinson from Chili Piper was talking about peer-to-peer -peer thought leadership. I was talking to Tracy Wallace from Clavio, and she was talking about thought leadership is a product of showing up and putting out quality content over time, and it helps you just be seen as a thought leader. And then some people are talking about net new concepts, so you're creating new frameworks, new categories, new models for accomplishing, for solving problems. So it's really interesting. So for you, it's expertise, education, and innovation are the three pillars of thought leadership for you. Right. And I think some of those definitions have those things like the innovation part, like new concepts, new frameworks, and that's good. But I think that if you just keep it to yourself and you don't educate others about it, you're not a thought leader because leadership is about having followers. If you don't have followers, you're not a leader, right? So you may be an expert innovator, but if you don't educate people, then I don't think you're a thought leader. Right. You're a subject matter expert or practitioner. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I can get behind that definition. I love it. So when I was researching you and getting to know you a little bit better, I noticed you have a really interesting background, a good few decades of tangentially related professions. So you have been a webmaster, a book author, a publisher, a business coach, speaker, video editor, content writer, founder of not one, but a few different companies, to name just a few. And now you're a content marketing manager at Dooley. So I'm curious, throughout this kind of long, interesting career that you've had, 
When did thought leadership first come on your radar? So I knew of the, about the concept, of course, but it was maybe the summer of 2021 when I, I was the director of digital marketing and content marketing at a sales training company. And I was just burned out. I was working a lot and I wasn't seeing a lot of results from what we were doing, at least from what I wanted. So I began looking for a different way to get an edge on my career. And so I quit my job. I went to another company, a SaaS company, I just as a content writer. My boss said, I can't believe you're leaving your director role to go to be an, an IC. And I said, I don't care about the role. I want to do something different. And looking for that edge, I started studying about thought leadership. And I said, wow, this is great. But what I found is that there was a gap. Like every book out there about thought leadership, you had to be someone already to be able to be a thought leader. So either an academic at a prestigious university or a leader or a C executive or a celebrity of some sort. And I say, what about me? What about uh, a solopreneur or, or just a marketing professional or a sales professional who wants to become a thought leader? How do they do it? So I couldn't find anything about it. So I decided to talk to experts, study some more, interview practitioners. And that's how I came up with the solo thought leadership framework. And that's what I explained in my latest book, which was published last March, the solo thought leader. So that's how I became interested. And a year later is like, here I am talking to you in a podcast about thought leadership and open a lot of doors to talk about it and learn from people like you, people like Bill Sherman and others on, on LinkedIn. I love it. I just love talking to people who are passionate about thought leadership. You know, people like Bill who have been actually in it, working as a, you know, a practitioner for like 20 years. There are some of us who, you know, started later on, but it's that passion and that interest in trying to dig into what it really means because it means different things to different people and trying to kind of get to the heart of where are the common overlaps and what is the truth. And something that I heard you say in your triangle, expertise, education, innovation, you talked about this kind of perception that you have to already be someone. You have to be a professor at Harvard. You have to be a CEO at some big company. So where do you kind of draw the line between role, so like your status in terms of like how others perceive you, and actually having expertise. Can an individual contributor have enough expertise to be viewed by others as a thought leader, in your opinion? Yes, I think so. So it's not a matter of title. So when I talk about solo thought leadership, it's, I say it's a new breed of people that uh, you don't need titles, you need results, you don't need credentials, you need expertise, right? So it's not about the degree, the position, because it doesn't give you expertise or there's a lot of CEOs who've never innovated in their lives or they're not educating, right? Like I work with companies where the CEO, it's probably an engineer who has zero interest in being out there, being the face of the company or being a thought leader. They just want to do their thing, focus on the products, right? And they have this product led companies, which is all about, you know, let's create the best product and they're not doing anything out there. Well, there are some individual contributors that say, I'm passionate about this. I want to evangelize the category or, or what we do here, and they can become thought leaders. Do you think, so I've also gotten different perspective on, on this. Do you think that it's okay for someone to set out and say, I want to go be a thought leader, and then they can kind of like take the steps to become a thought leader? Or do you feel like a path that is typically more successful is just being a practitioner, focusing on getting those results and sharing the expertise and kind of detaching yourself from wanting to be a thought leader. And maybe by taking that path of leading through expertise, you might get to where you want to go quicker. Do you have any kind of opinions on that? Like, is it good to try to be a thought leader or is it good to just try to be an expert who's trying to get results and share their expertise? Well, I think it's a little bit of both, especially because I, I would say, don't call yourself a thought leader, right? It's not a, a self-imposed title. It's something that's earned. Like people recognize you as a thought leader. I would never put like, I'm a thought leader on my LinkedIn headline, right? Or anything like that. I'm a thought leadership marketing pirate. That's what I say, but I'm not a thought leader. That's not what I say on myself. But I think you have to be intentional. So. 
if there's a framework and I, that's why, why I build a framework of the solo thought leadership is like, these are the steps, seven steps you can do to be recognized as the go-to expert in your niche. So when you're intentional about something and you do, uh, you act on those intentions, then you get quicker to your goal. So yes, you have to be an expert. Yes, you have to be a practitioner, but you have to be intentional in creating frameworks and educating people on those frameworks. So I, that's why I'd say it's a bit of both. I got it. I got what you're saying. So you have to be intentional because otherwise you're just maybe sharing things, but you're not innovating. You're not doing like Seth Godin where you're now taking, you know, something, spinning it upside down, helping people think about things in a disruptive way, right? So your, your seven step framework. Why don't you talk me through that? What are those seven steps that someone could follow so that hopefully others will bestow upon them the title of thought leader? Okay. So the framework, like I have a book here, like solo thought leader. So it's seven steps and I play with the concept of the solo, right? So the first one is the solo expert. So as we were saying, you have to be an expert. You have to know your topic. You have to know the ins and outs before it's like a musician before they start improvising, they need to know all the basics, right? The second step is innovation. So you have to be the solo innovator and that's, you have to look for a new angle. You have to establish your unique point of view. Like what is it that you think, or you believe about this that goes against, or is not in line with the best practices or what's already done. So you, you're looking for something radically new. Then you have to find your voice, right? So how are you going to communicate it? Because this is important for a thought leader. It has to be a good communicator, either by writing, public speaking, or video, or podcasting, whatever. So you have to find your voice and your style that people will recognize you, that people will listen or read something and they say, oh, that's Aaron, right? This is not Diego, that's Aaron, or this is Diego, right? They, they will recognize you. Then you have to become an educator and start educating people. And that means writing, that means podcasting, whatever, but you have to dominate social media because that's where people are. So you have to find out the social channel where your audience is hanging out and just dominate it. Then after you do that, you also have to become, I call it the solo star. So you need social proof. So you need to start getting results, getting testimonials, getting a tribe following that will back up your claims. So you have to start creating community. Then, because this is for solopreneurs, I think you need a business or a way to have systems in place to sustain your thought leadership. And this is where, you know, many people will differ like, what if I don't have my own business? What if I'm just working at a company? So yes, you can do both, but for the solo thought leaders, for the solopreneur, entrepreneur, or founder, you have to set up system because doing thought leadership takes time, time to think, time to create content, time to educate, time to connect with people in your community. So you have to have systems in place for your business. So it runs by itself. And finally, I call it the solo author and is that you have to write a book, something where your framework is explained in full, so you can amplify your message. So those are the seven steps. I talked to Ashley Foss about this on the first episode of the podcast about books and how that is kind of viewed by many as the ultimate forum of thought leadership. She has a framework. I'm sure you're familiar with it. She has the four pillars and one of them is being prolific. And that means creating different types of content, short form, long form across multiple channels. And so like at the top of the, you know, the crest of that particular pillar would be authoring a book, which is really scary to a lot of people. I mean, I know that you have a lot to say in that kind of realm and we'll get to that. I just wanted to kind of click into one thing you said about dominating social media and creating community. When you say creating a community, just so people that are listening are clear, are you talking about creating a community with your followers and your audience on the social media platform? Or are you trying to offboard that followership to a different platform, a community such as 
a Slack community, an email list? What do you recommend there in terms of creating community? I think the channel is not the main focus. I mean, it, it may work for you to do it on social media. Like if you see Chris Walker, he has, you can say his community is right there on LinkedIn, right? Or TikTok now. Like he, he has the comments, people are interacting. So the community is happening in the comment section of his posts, right? While others, they may have a, a Discord or Slack channel, or they may have an email list. So whatever works for you. The important thing is that you have a group of people who identify with your thoughts, with what you're saying, and you can get feedback from them. You can bounce ideas off them. You can also listen to them. And that's how you refine your frameworks. Because I think a thought leader, it's also building in public. And it's many times he or she is thinking out loud with their community. And that's how they get feedback. That's how they refine their frameworks. And that's how things change. And that's how you engage in the community with those thoughts. Because I've been in many communities, in many groups, and most of them fail because there's no one leading the community with leading thoughts. I used to be in, uh, well, I think you were with uh, Justin Welsh in audience and income, right? And this is the only community that I saw like was really active and people were working, but because Justin was there, you know, putting out content, generating thought leadership, generating ideas, and people were engaging with that around those topics. Well, I, now I'm in other communities that it's like, I don't know, crickets, <laughs> there's no one there or just barely anyone there just sharing their links to their LinkedIn posts or, or Twitter. But nothing is happening because there's no one leading the charge with leading thought. I love that. That's why Justin only lasted a year because he spent so much time. It was almost like too much of a time commitment to maintain that level of right. a community. It was really intense. But yeah, that's how we first met. I think we were both in that community. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. But you see like with the example of Chris Walker, like it works. He's there all the time and that's why it works. Yeah, for sure. Systems are important. So carving out time, what's your kind of advice for building systems? How do you get started? I mean, I'm a solopreneur these days. I don't have any plans to be an agency or add employees. I'm very happy on my own after like a decade of managing people. So for someone like me, I, and I also don't aspire to be a thought leader, but let's say I did, what are some systems that I could put in place to help me reach my goal? Okay. So I would say. You find your niche, you start engaging with them, you create community and I think your podcast, your newsletter are great ways to start creating community and you keep top of mind, right? And you keep engaging with them. Then you create your framework. You say, okay, what is it that I think about for leadership or whatever topic you want to talk about? You create your, your, your own framework and then you start talking about it in different ways, in different formats and you start refining it. And I would say, Erin, eventually you, you should write a book about your framework and w we can talk about that, why you should do that. And then keep creating content, keep engaging with people, but also keep innovating with new thoughts all the time. And the way I, I think is most people don't come up with original ideas. They just copy what others say, or they just comment on the news or they just think they have opinions about things that are happening. But I would say, try to create an original piece of thought with a uh, different point of view, questioning stuff, disruptive content, at least once a month. Oh, once a month. Okay. Yes. You and can't be a one hit wonder. No, don't be a, a one hit wonder. Like for instance, like I try with my newsletter, which comes out every week. I try to come up with different stuff and that's why I try to coin new terms or, you know, question beliefs or the things that people say or interview people who are interesting because, you know, there's no full leadership if you're not having leading thoughts. There's no thought leadership if you're not taking the time to think and come up with new ways of, of communicating things. So. I think it, the most important thing is don't just try to be prolific. Prolific is great, but the quality also matters. And the quality matters because you don't just write stuff, you think before you write. 
I love that. And that's where the expertise comes in for me. Like, I can't even help but to like share what's wrong with things because I just get so pissed off by like the state of certain things. Like, and that could be perceived as a leading thought, but I'm just like commenting on the state of why I think it sucks to talk about content in buckets. Like, SEO content, thought leadership content. Like, I did that just like everyone else. And then because of my years of expertise, I was able to kind of stop and be like, this sucks. I don't like this. There's got to be a better way to talk about content, right? And that could be considered a leading thought because the more you have experience, the more you're able to see these patterns and not accept things for what people tell you you should accept. And that's where the expertise comes in, in my case. Like, I don't know that you could be a thought leader if you have been, let's say I've been six months and I'm a LinkedIn. I don't know. There's a lot of LinkedIn experts and coaches these days, and they've been doing it for six months and they put out a course. And how can you really write disruptive content? I feel like a lot of that, a lot of times they're just taking what Justin Welch taught and kind of like repackaging it. And that's not a leading thought, right? A leading thought is disruptive. It's questioning the norms. Um, so what is your advice for someone who has this urge to kind of start coming up with this disruptive content? How do you start? Do you sit down and like work through a list of commonly held beliefs within an industry? And like, how does that go? How do you coach people in doing that? Yeah. So that's one really good way to do it. Like, okay, what are the dogmas in your industry? What's the sort of things that people usually repeat? Like, this is true. And then ask yourself, what if it's not true? What would it like if this weren't true? So I'll give you an example. One dogma of sales and marketing is you have to be customer centric, right? So one day I started thinking, is there a time where I should not be customer centric? And I thought about it and I said, yes, you know, when I'm creating a new category, I cannot be customer centric. I have to be mission centric. So I have a vision, I have a mission to change things. And if I were customer centric, people will tell me, oh, this is what we like, but because I'm creating something new, I cannot listen to them. I have to go against the grain and be mission centric. This is my mission. Eventually I will change some minds and right. And the category will be more mainstream, but that's an example. So you say in what situation this best practice or this accepted dogma would not be true. Another way is ask yourself, what are some old ways or maybe some things that my customers are doing that are not working and what mindset shift do they need to have to have better results? Mm, I want to kind of stop there because you do content marketing for Dooley, a tech company. I've done content marketing for tech companies for a long time. And when you're talking or selling into executives, into the C-suite, they don't always need to be educated on basic things, right? So they need to be educated on fundamental shifts of a new school of thought, a new way of doing things. So I can kind of give a concrete example for listeners. At my last job at the Predictive Index, we were selling to HR leaders. And a lot of times, based on the history of HR and like where it came up from, the Industrial Revolution, all of that, HR was seen as a real tactical function, payroll, employee discipline, things like that. However, not all HR professionals are like that. A lot of them are very strategic and can offer a lot of value to an organization. They deserve that seat at the table, right? So that was kind of our fundamental belief that HR is and can be a strategic function and we need to enable these professionals with tools so that they can be part of these strategic conversations. And so we came up with a, a category called talent optimization. And we had this whole framework and we would draw it out on blackboards and we would get our partner network to draw it out on blackboards. We would do these LinkedIn takeovers. You know, we have an ultimate guide. We have courses, certifications, this and that, all because we believed that HR there are those tactical people and that's great. There's a need for that. We need people to do payroll and benefits. We also need people that are gonna lead the change in an organization. And they are part of that senior C-suite. 
And so how can we have a category to support our vision and of course our product fits in there? So that's kind of an example of content marketing supporting this disruptive kind of thought leadership play. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And you focus on there's a problem, then this is what you think the solution is, but hey, no, no, there's a new solution. There's a this different solution and this is what I'm educating you about. And I mean, for me personally, as a content marketer, I could never work for a company that wasn't a visionary and didn't have some sort of disruptive vision and disruptive technology. I fucking love it. Like I could just, I live for coming up with new ways to like come up with new frameworks and content and to like evangelize this new category and this new discipline. And that's so exciting for me. And I think that those of us content marketers who have been fortunate and blessed to have the opportunity to work with these kinds of companies and products, it's a whole new way of doing content. And it's kind of like life-changing compared to like that old school way, which a lot of us started with. It was like, hey, write this blog post. We want to rank for this term and we need it done in like an hour and it needs to be a thousand words. And you're like, fingers are bleeding. You're just like, oh, I'm going to like rephrase what I found here on page one of the SERP. And that is... It sucks. It's depressing. It's like a rat race. It's a race to the bottom in terms of pricing and career growth. And I'm just so fortunate that I discovered this new school of content marketing. And I'd like to pivot the conversation there because the other day you tagged me in a post and I freaking loved the post. And it was all about there are practitioners and influencers and some would say thought leaders who evangelize the old school or the old way of doing content marketing. And then there are some people who are evangelizing the new school of content marketing. Could you talk a little bit about how you view this old school versus new school? Right. So I told you about this job where I was burned out and I quit when I, where I was director of digital and content. And this is because we were doing old school. And old school was we were following Neil Patel's playbook and HubSpot's playbook of build a list of keywords you want to be found for, create some pillar pages, then clusters, write content that's longer, more comprehensive and better than the content that's currently ranking for those keywords. Then you create lead magnets, get a contact form, you place ads, then you share links to your blogs on social media and you capture demand. That's old school, right? And that used to work like 10 years ago, but right now people don't like that. Like if you think about the future of search and this is something I get a lot of uh, rap about because I go a lot against, you know, traditional SEO. I'm not saying don't do SEO, but don't focus on SEO as your main strategy. And people say, no, SEO works and okay, it works, but think about the future. Will we do, think about it in 10 years, is search going to be the same as it is today? I bet it's not going to be. So why focus on something that's just going to be part of the past? So the new school, it's you create your own category with your own keywords, and then you write disruptive thought leadership content with a unique point of view, instead of just content that's a bit better than the one that's ranking. Instead of just doing gated content, gated PDFs, you become a media company where you educate people with ungated resources in different formats, wherever they are, video, podcasting, live events, webinars, you know, questions, stuff like that. You publish zero click content on social media, native content, not just, Hey, here's my latest blog post here on the click here. You know, the algorithm is not going to even amplify that anyway. So why do it? And instead of capturing demand, you start creating demand. I think that's the new school that it's more effective. And what I'm saying is what you're doing there is you're upgrading content marketing to thought leadership marketing. So do you believe that content marketing as a term is going to eventually to like go away and people are going to talk more about thought leadership marketing, or do you think that's only going to be a certain subset of marketers who are going to kind of think that way, think about thought leadership and, and category creation? Well, I wrote a, an article last. One in January, and it's actually a chapter of my book 
that's called content marketing is dying, long live thought leadership. <laughs> and <laughs> it went viral. Like a lot of people like read it. Some people hated it. Some people love it. Most people are loving it so far, but it's just talking about this. And I don't know if the term is going to go away, but I think it's going to be a legacy term. And I think we need to go beyond content and actually create value and move with the flow. Like if you think about what's going on, you see, maybe not the millennials, but at least generation C, C or C, like we say here in Canada, they're not using Google to search for stuff. They're using TikTok, they're using YouTube, they're using voice search, they're asking their friends. So content has to change for the new generation. So we cannot keep doing the same thing. So I think that's one of the definitions that I also like about thought leadership is that a thought leadership is looking at the future. So how is the world one, the world going to be? And then I start educating people about that future, where we're going, not where we are right now or where we were 10 years ago. And if you see the people who are defending, like people who criticize, Hey, you can say that content marketing is dying, that SEO is not the best thing. You look what they do. They're SEO specialists, mm -hmm. SEO managers. And it's like, you know, Rand Fishkin came with this uh, study a couple of years ago about zero click searches. Yeah. You know how people go to Google, they find information in the snippets and they don't end up going anywhere. And yep. he said something between 65 and 80%. Now. Recently, SEMrush came out with a new study saying, oh, that was wrong. We have the best data and it's only 17% of searches that end up in no clicks. And this was an SEO guy who was talking about the SEMrush article. He said, you know, I'm glad he, they did this because there's no bias in this one. And I thought, come on, there's no bias in SEMrush saying that search <laughs> and SEO and SEM already a thing, is still a thing. That, that doesn't make sense. It's like a pharmaceutical company saying, oh no, this disease is probably, you need our, our medicine, right? Here's the thing. You need to take every study with a grain of salt. And that applies whether or not a company is doing proprietary research to publish their own research report, something I'm very passionate about and I help my clients do. Or if you're seeing a Forrester report, because guess what? There's a company paying Forrester to co-author or lead the charge on producing this report on behalf of the company. It's the same fucking thing as if the company produced it themselves with, of course, the support from certified data analysts and professionals mm -hmm. who know how to design a survey to reduce bias and such. I wouldn't say that some random like marketing specialist should be you know, doing that all single-handedly and actually have a course on research reports. And I actually say, I don't do it myself. I don't go it alone because I need an actual data scientist to keep me honest and make sure that I'm not asking questions in a way that introduce bias or asking leading mm -hmm. questions. If you've listened to any of my episodes, you know that I'm kind of like, I suck at that. I tend to be very casual and occasionally I accidentally ask leading questions. So I love surveys. I love writing survey questions, but I don't fucking do it alone. And I don't think anyone should because the integrity of your report matters. And of course, people need to take proprietary data and reports with a grain of salt. But when you are actually partnering with a valid firm to help you do it, then at least you know that it's not just like all made up, right? It's not like, oh, uh, you know, we surveyed 500 people and they, oh, guess what? You know, 95% of searches end in a click published by, you know, ClearScope or whatever. Like, People aren't going to believe that because, of course, there's always some sort of agenda underpinning any of these reports, right? Right. T totally agree. So, and I mean, and data-driven content is part of any thought leadership motion. Like, that's great. Great thought leadership content is original research. But as you say, you have to be very careful and, uh, you know, account for biases and stuff like that and, and do it right. You know what I love about reports? Some people do them really freaking good. And what they do is they connect the dots, right? So they're not just saying, okay, finding one, 40% of people feel this way. Finding two, 
35% of people say this. Like, that is a boring report. That's not a leading thought. It's Yeah, granted, it's original proprietary data. That's good. But those are not leading thoughts on their own. Those are just data points. Leading thoughts are when you contextualize the information for your audience and you connect the dots between things. You say, you know, so for example, you know, 40% of people feel this way. Why is that? Could that be because as this other data point found and you're connecting the dots and you're making hypothesis and that is really where the reports get interesting. And that's really where you can find these interesting tidbits and these questions and you can create content for like six to 12 months off the back of these interesting connect the dot opportunities within your report. And that to me is like awesome content. I love it. Yeah, love it too. Very and it's not easy to do. That takes expertise. It takes being a subject matter expert or working with subject matter experts to help you understand, interpret, and analyze the data. Because if you don't have that contextual understanding, you won't be able to connect those dots. It's too hard. Exactly. Yeah. Totally agree. So I, speaking of terms that you coined, I know the other day you said something about thought-led growth. Where did you come up with that? Tell me where your head's at around that. Okay. So because I work in SaaS, we talk a lot about self-led growth, product-led growth, and I'm trying to find a place for thought leadership within those, those, within those business strategies. And I came up with this thought-led growth where, you know, how do we use thought leadership for growth as a growth strategy and not just as a, oh, a kind of content, right? Right. And so I define thought lead, thought led growth as a business strategy that uses thought leadership marketing to attract, convert, and retain customers. And it won't stand maybe on its own for now, but it can actually help SaaS companies strengthen their PLG motion and service companies and entrepreneurs to boost their sales led growth or their marketing led growth strategies. And I'll give you an example. So. PLG is very focused on, you know, better UX, reduction, reducing friction in the buying process, and not so much on differentiation and uniqueness. So PLG companies have very strong product teams and very strong product marketing. But the problem with that is that the competition is also doing the same thing, copying features, coming up with new features of their own. So. Marketing end up, ends up being this battle of features and you create these battle cards and you create these pages where you compare this solution to this other one. And there's this battle between features. But when you use Thalyoshi marketing, you go beyond the features and you evangelize about the, evangelize the problem and you give people reason to pay attention to what they need to pay attention, not the features, but the problem that they have. And you move the conversation from which features are better to, hey, this is why you need to tackle this problem and try our solution. I love it. And in so many cases, when you're you know, looking at the industry leaders, a lot of them have really similar features and you're not necessarily gonna choose one because the feature set is so much more amazing than the others. In many cases, sometimes there are, but a lot of times you're going to choose the one that you feel like is going to be the best partner or the best strategic partner for you to help you accomplish your goals and beyond the point of sale, right? So like, yeah, I want you to onboard me and help me solve my problems today, but are you going to be that partner to grow with me? Like, what can we accomplish in three years, five years, you know? So I think that's where a lot of the leading thoughts and the thought leadership come in, especially with enterprise sales long sales cycles, big investments. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to use this. I'm going to pay $9.99 a month to have Grammarly. Like, it's not that. It's kind of like a, a much more complicated, complex business model. And that is really where you have to prove to people that you're credible, you're a strategic partner, and you're not just a good product. Because like I said, there could be other alternatives that are going to help you get the job done. Right. And, and traditional content marketing has fallen into the trap of just saying, oh, this is what you need. This is our, these are our features and repeating content, right? But thought will go beyond that. And actually, as you said, 
you know, give leading thoughts to the leadership of the company and understanding what is this going to do for you, for the bottom line, for changing the way you think and people are more productive, you have more time or whatever benefits there are. Yeah. So at Dooley, how important is thought leadership to your content strategy? Where does that kind of come in? So I'm leading the thought leadership motion there at Dooley. And this is something that I focus on for things on research and on thought leadership content. So one thing I do is uh, every other week I meet with Chris, our CEO, and we talk about a topic and I create content based on our interview. So what is his point of view about, you know, being a high performer, being productive, being a sales rep and having freedom to sell, right? So we create content around his unique point of view. And that speaks to both the individual sellers and to sales leaders. And then the other part is like, we start creating our own original research. So we are constantly surveying customers and our audience and getting data from them and they were connecting points. So we recently released a report on sales productivity where we survey about 500 sales reps and we got the responses. We analyzed that and we came up with the sales stages for sales productivity and how people are reacting to that and what they're doing in their jobs. So it's, it's twofold. So it's data driven and it's also, okay, an original point of view. And that's driving our content in certain ways. So we can go out there and through the newsletter that we ju I just launched, just getting those people out there and we're seeing good results. People are saying, okay, I identify with this. I know what mm. you mean. Yeah. Interesting. So for people who don't know what Dooley does, like how closely does that topic of sales productivity like map or tie into your actual product and your product capabilities? Like, are you a sales productivity tool? How closely aligned do you think this content and this thought leadership needs to be with the product? Should there be really tight alignment, loose alignment? Does it depend? I think it, it goes both ways. Like at the end of the day, you need to tie it back to your product, right? Because that's what you're doing, right? You want to know people. This is the problem that you have. This is maybe a few ways that you're trying to solve it, but this is how we help you solve. It. This is the solution, right? So you're trying to position your company, your product, your service as the solution for the problem that they have. So the followership is evangelizing the, the, the problem. So if I were just doing, you know, product marketing, I would say, Hey, we have these new features. We have all this. This is, you can do a hundred things with Dooley, right? But instead I'm telling people, Hey. You have, and so we came up with this messaging, like it's a uh, hit OTE with a working OT. Okay. Well, so something that reps can tell, okay, I want to get my goals, get the revenue, but I don't want to work over, over time. Right. So this is how we help you. You know, we organize you, we give you the tools. So you have a sales process that's repeatable and that you can concentrate on selling and not doing the admin work or the things you hate that take your time away from selling. So that's what we're doing this scholarship around. We use the concept of freedom to sell, right? Wouldn't you love to have the freedom to sell instead of spending, I don't know, one hour updating Salesforce? Right. And that's an intriguing way to spin it. Yeah. Freedom. Freedom. And that's how you use. In thought leadership, you use language and you use concepts that are not common, but that people would say, okay, it makes you stop and say, okay, what are you saying? Okay. Oh, I get it. I get it. That's what you're trying to say. I can identify with that. I love that. And for me, like thinking about reports and like, I agree that it needs to always map back to the product in some way, but there's a spectrum of how closely it needs to tie into your product. And that really depends on your goals for the report. Like, do you really need something that your sales reps can use as part of the sales cycle to help overcome objections, to help prove the business case, to prove the market need? Then maybe you want to ask questions that map to your product functionalities and capabilities. Maybe you want to have a report that really shows that companies that use tools 
that help them do A, B, and C have better business outcomes. Oh, guess what? We happen to have a tool that helps companies do A, B, and C. This means that you can infer if you use a tool like ours, you too can have better business outcomes. That's really on the far end of the spectrum. It's really, really tightly aligned to the product. That can be great for sales enablement, even for self-serve buyers who are on your site and they discover this. And But the thing is, if you're trying to really get a lot of brand awareness and you're trying to get press and get you know your report mentioned and write guest blogs on big industry publications and websites, that's not going to fly because they don't cover things that are that closely tied to the product, in my experience. Whereas if your report is on the opposite side of the spectrum, where it's tangentially related, for example, if you sell an, like a software for employee engagement, there's a lot of those, right? It's a huge market for employee engagement software. But you're not talking about using tools at all. You're just talking about engagement in a more of an abstract way. And you're asking people, what are these factors that help you feel more engaged with your job or more disengaged? What are these factors? And you're not just like spitballing those answers back, but you're putting it in a framework and you're categorizing these like buckets of people or this buckets of engagement. And that's really where the leading thoughts come in with coming up with the report. Now that report, it might not do like quite as well in terms of like helping to sell the product or helping to show the product validity. However, I bet you you're going to have a much easier time getting coverage in an industry site. So it really depends on your goals. And I think a strategy, a good strategy would include both, right? Right. Because, I mean, if you think about the stages of the buyer's journey, like people who are in the middle or the bottom, they need that content that, you know, pushes them over to, okay, this is the solution, right? But if you're just in the awareness stage, yeah, you, you want more content around the problem and people being aware, okay, this is something I need to solve. Yeah. Wrapping your head around the problem. And for companies, like showing that you're an expert in the problem is a really smart thing to do. Yeah. yeah. So I talked to Dan Stamon from Gainsight and he is the chief evangelist there. And he says that he's on the road all the time doing public speaking, being invited to events. And he never, ever talks about Gainsight. He talks about customer success, which is a category. Yeah. I love that because others are talking about the product and the product content exists apart from him, right? So that makes a lot of sense. So we're coming up on time. I know that you have this awesome book and I'm going to put links to your website and your business and your book and all of that in the show notes on my website. But for listeners that want to connect with you and follow you, what's the best way for them to do that? So please connect with me on LinkedIn. That's where I am every day. Just search for Diego Pineda on LinkedIn. And you can also check out more of some of my content around thought leadership. You just go to thoughtleadership.marketing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Diego. This has been a really fun conversation and thanks for your time. Yes. Thank you, Erin. I really enjoyed. Thanks for joining us on this episode of The Notorious Thought Leader. If you're looking for more stories from marketers who are generating demand from thought leadership, then visit us at motionagency.io slash notorious. See you next time.